what's really in surgical smoke? That's really what all of this comes down to. Hopefully, uh, none of us sit in the operating room with a cigarette sticking through our masks. But I think as you see as we move forward, maybe we should. Maybe that would be less dangerous than some of the things that we actually do. If you break apart surgical smoke, 95% of it is water vapor. Remember how much of the human body is made up of just plain old water. It's a huge amount. So 95% is just water vapor. Well, that can't be bad, right? It's water vapor. It's that other 5% that we need to be nervous about and we need to think about and we need to look really hard at what we do every day to make that 5% less important. And break it down into four big groups of things in that 5%. Particulate matter, organic acids, inorganic acids, and yes, microorganisms that aren't dead, like I like to believe they are, but lots of microorganisms that aren't dead. Well, now smoke evacuators have come a long way, um, thanks to industry who have worked tirelessly to build the correct type of smoke evacuators that are built into cautery that are there to do what they're supposed to do, but yet they're still not 100% effective, and they're never likely going to be 100% effective. There's things that most of us in the operating room, particularly the non-surgeon in the operating room, has no control about of whether that evacuator is going to work even to its best capability, the type of case you're doing. Now, I can recall multiple cases of smashed livers from motor vehicle crashes where we used the cautery for 30 minutes at a time. It was the only way to get the liver to stop bleeding, and you cauterized, and you cauterized, and you cauterized. I don't care how good your evacuator was, you were not going to get the majority of the smoke. It was just too much. It's affected by the position of the pencil, the way the surgeon holds the cautery unit. If you hold it perfectly correctly, the amount of smoke the evacuator takes is, is nearly 100%. It's great. Unfortunately, the tissue doesn't always allow you to do that unless you want to crawl inside the abdomen, which is still considered a problem. So position of the pencil, position of the surgeon, and then use. If you don't have it on, and you, on the table, and you don't have it turned on, I promise you it's not going to work. When I, um, for the first many years that I operated, uh, I have to admit, which is unfortunate now that I'm into this portion of the world, but I love the, sell, the smell of surgical smoke. There was just something about it. So that little smoke evacuator, yeah, it may be good, but I didn't realize what was bad in the smoke, and you took away the smell, so it was easy to push the evacuator to the side. We look at airflow. Can we change the airflow in an operating room so all the bad stuff goes away and the good stuff doesn't go away? Even though the airflow was not designed to protect us from surgical smoke, it was designed to protect the patient from bad things like bacteria and things that we don't want to get back in the body cavities. It also has a clear direct effect on what happens to the smoke. These are heat images that were taken and published in 2002. And in this, so this room is a conventional airflow room. And if you look at where all of the particles, and you can ignore the heat for, for this case, but look at where all the particles go. You can see that they're doing a pretty good job of getting away from the patient who's sitting down here. But look at the healthcare workers. They're all right in the middle of the airflow. So every time the electric cautery unit is activated, where does it go? It goes right into that airflow. It goes right into your mask or around the corner of your mask or under the bottom of your mask. And you get to breathe that great smelling but really bad for you stuff. So we change the rooms and we put in laminar airflow. Let's direct. Let's tell the air where it has to go. We know that that's good if you're trying to move bacteria away from the patient, for example, because the airflow is up and away from their body. So again, here's our patient laying down here. If you look at the airflow, it's going up, and it's all going straight up, but look where it goes by as it goes up. It goes right by the face of everybody that's surrounding the table. 
So even in a laminar airflow room, surgical smoke still has the opportunity to go exactly where we don't want it to go. So there are a lot of things that we do and we work hard with evacuators and flow and ways to affect what's happening to the healthcare workers in the room, but there are things that we're missing. People still commonly ask, well, so what? Why does it really matter? We're there for the patient anyway. Um, the patient's commonly asleep. Most of them have a protected respiratory system while they're asleep. They're intubated. The air they're getting has no surgical smoke in it. Even if they're awake, they're separated from the majority of that flow, or at least we thought so, um, by the drapery. So there's a, they're not in the direct contact of the, of the flow of the smoke. And of course, the surgeons always argue, well, gosh, I'm just there for a couple of cases a day anyway. But the reality is the non-surgeons in the room, 